Okay, uh, well, thanks Demetrios for coming for the next uh, Robot Learning Seminar. Um, Demetrios is a, an Associate Professor at UCL in Robotics and Computation and a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow. Um, so he works on loco manipulation um, and he's brought along a robot to give some, some kind of live demo later, which is always awesome in a robotics talk. You very rarely see that, so thanks for doing that. Um, I think local manipulation is really interesting to me because I just work on regular manipulation, so you know, a robot with arms, and quite often my students are complaining that actually the things are slightly out of reach, um, and the robot can't quite get around, and it's surprising how even with a long robot arm, uh, the robot can't always get access to all of the objects in the environment. So I'm quite jealous that you get to be able to do a bit of both and solve some of those problems with legs. Um, and thanks very much for coming. So over yeah. to you, Dimitri. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. By the way, should we demonstrate in the end anyway? We'll just demonstrate some classic MPC and uh, RL locomotion there. The talk is not going to be too much technical. Sorry for that. <laughs> uh, so it's going to be more general uh, what, what I have been doing and uh, what we are doing at, uh, now at UCL, but also some previous work. Uh, there, so I'm Dimitris Kamilas, I'm, I'm Associate Professor at uh, UCL Computer Science and I'm also a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow, uh, which, is, which relaxes me a little bit from teaching uh, and admin uh, duties, basically. Okay, so, uh, yeah, the truth is that I didn't start with robotics, so my, my background during my bachelor and master degree uh, is in game theory. So I still hold the best approximation for uh, biomatrices games, uh, best NAS uh, equilibrium approximation. Uh, but then uh, I met uh, a, a, a graduate student from MIT that became my, my advisor for the PhD, so I went to robotics. And I started working on bipedal locomotion, uh, then a little bit on manipulation. And um, nowadays I I call what I'm working on cognitive local manipulation, basically. Uh, where are we based? We are based at UCL East. Uh, so this is a new campus. I hope I will be able to invite you at some point. We're still unpacking, uh, but we we have a nice set of new people, new robots that uh, we we work there uh, for um, uh, for uh, research and teaching. All right. Uh, obviously, I'm not alone. I I, I do have a quite uh, diverse team, I think, that uh, our main, our main um, research areas is on perception and planning, but of course, since it's robotic, we do a little bit of, of uh, control and, and design. All right, so robots that I have worked with, and you will see in this, in this talk, uh, humanoid robots, this was mainly at uh, IIT, this is my passion, they are not very cheap, so we still don't have any uh, here. Uh, that's why we, we moved to, to leg robots, uh, of course, for other reasons, like stability and efficiency in locomotion. And um, uh, capabilities of these robots, so uh, they're, they're quite strong robots, some of them. So up on the top part, you see the, the robots at uh, IIT, humanoid robots, um, uh, looking like, uh, like humans. On the lower part, you see quadrupedal or animaloid robots uh, that uh, very, they are very strong and, and uh, agile, I would say. Now, I would like to think that the main interest of, of the research that we are doing lies in one word, which is uh, affordances. And this really has been defined in, in the 80s, 70s and 80s. And uh, basically, our affordances are resources that the environment offers to animals and humans. Um, but they have the capability to perceive and use it, all right? Uh, and the main, the main purpose of our research is uh, to figure out what are these affordances when you walk, when you manipulate, uh, when you're performing some, uh, some tasks. Now, why we are interested in, in, in legged robots? That's a very interesting, interesting uh, question. Uh, I think... The way that uh, we think about it is that uh, those robots are capable in entering and, and uh, um, working in environments 
that are uh, designed for humans and animals. Okay, so a building that has uh, stairs and doors. Okay, so it is very natural that if we want to uh, help humans in this kind of tasks, we have to use um, a similar uh, structured uh, robots. Uh, and the, the main interest is in uncertain and unstructured environment. Okay, uh, I checked recently that uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry Pratt has a very nice and interesting uh, table of what biped, quadrupeds, wilt and track robots can do and cannot do. Uh, and I got this, uh, this image from, from his talk. Uh, it's a little bit biased, <laughs> so <laughs> I think he, he believes definitely that humanoids is the, <laughs> is the, is, you know, the ultimate uh, robot uh, to perform tasks. Uh, but obviously the community has focused on quadrupeds because of uh, stability and efficiency uh, purposes. Uh, humanoids are a little bit more difficult, as we will see. Now, the main question that uh, I'm trying to, to answer is how, how link robots can gain the knowledge to operate in structure and uh, complex and, and uncertain environments. And I think the answer to that is uh, perceptual cognition for locomotion and manipulation. Um, and because I'm Greek, I have to show uh, an Italian fresco here, a zoom in from the School of Athens, uh, where you see basically um, Plato pointing up to the gut and uh, Aristotle pointing down to the earth. And um, I know that this is an invitation talk from the Robotics Learning Club, <laughs> uh, but you know. These are two different um, approaches that uh, you will see in this, in this uh, talk. It's, it's that, you know, basically Plato believed that uh, in rationalism, right? So um, in pre-existing entities that they provide a certain knowledge about the environment, about the, about the, 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 the world, gravity, okay? So th do you need to learn gravity if we already know, or it is like a something that exists already uh, by nature. Aristotle in the other, in the other way was more like the machine learning guy, uh, which believed that you know, everything is, is, is an outcome of sensory experience. All right, I do believe in the mixture of these things. Okay, so you will not see pure learning or pure physical reasoning um, approaches here, but uh, probably a mixture on this. So the talk will be focused on locomotion, then on manipulation, and then a little bit uh, a glimpse on, on what we uh, were doing now, or we try to do now. So when I started my, my PhD, Boston Dynamics was, was doing very impressive things. Probably you have seen all, all the uh, videos there. Um, even though we don't know how good they're working in real life, I mean, obviously they, they also, always in the end of the video, they show the failure, the failure cases. But we have a pretty good understanding of how things are working. So, uh, from the videos again. Uh, so, what, what you see here is, uh, is uh, some GIFs and some images that I got from, from their videos. Uh, and what you see is that basically what they do is that they have a kind of a predefined environment where they have planes and they plan dyma dynamic motions using this planner representation of the environment. Uh, with a mixture of motion primitives, so they have primitive motions like jumping or, or um, you know, walking uh, uh, through an MPC controller. It's not simple, but I think the development is under some assumptions, which are uh, either the environment is mostly not well structured, which is in this case, um, you know, uncertain can be tolerated from low level uh, feedback control. Uh, most of these robots are reactive robots, so if they, if they think that they will fall, they will react uh, to balance. Uh, and other proprioception sensing uh, can, uh, can, can help with, uh, with understanding the environment. What, uh, what I started in, uh, what I, I was hoping to, to do in my PhD was to, uh, to resolve uh, similar questions but using 3D perception. All right. And, um, <coughs> And, and the reason is that these methods, they don't always work, the, 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 classic, the classic approaches. So here you see uh, Spot dealing with uh, some really rough terrain and, and obviously goes with a reactive walking 
and it is not able to accommodate all the uncertainty that exists in the environment, probably a slippery rock, um, and so on. On the upper part, of course, uh, you see Boston Dynamics uh, Atlas um, failing for multiple reasons. It can be mechanical, it can be the control, it can be the perception, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And what you see is that, you know, we and animals, we kind of do much better and uh, much nicer uh, when we have to uh, when we have to deal with uh, with really difficult environments. Uh, up in the video is me hiking down. And I'm not a sports person, so you know if I can do it, <laughs> uh, most of humans can do it. And down here you can see like uh, the classic goats and uh, cheetah uh, animals really navigating into uh, um, difficult environments in a completely different gait than the than sport. And if you think a little bit about it, uh, I think that what it, what we are really missing is the cognition about the environment to achieve this kind of uh, this kind of motions. So when, when I started my PhD, um, the very first question and the, the, probably the only question that uh, I was thinking was how we can perceive and model uh, the environment for bipedal locomotion. Okay, and, and what we thought with my advisor back then was that when humans are hiking on, on rocks uh, or climbing rocks, they may consider only a sparse set of footholds, right? Uh, and this is crucial because the majority of the community back then, even now, uh, they consider a very dense representation of the world, which is either point clouds, meshes, you name it. Okay. So instead, what we thought is that what if we can model both surfaces on the robot and on the environment uh, geometrically, in order to uh, reason about contact between the environment and the robot. And, and, and the way we did it is by introducing uh, second degree bounded pop polynomials that I will show you in the next slide, uh, which are curved so that I can represent easily um, curved surfaces. Uh, they are geometrically meaningful with minimal parameterization, which is good for um, reasoning about contact. And we can quantify uncertainty. Um, now it's here it's represented as, as Gaussian um, distributions on the foot and on the on the ground in order to uh, to reason about uh, reason about conduct. And I'm not going to go into details, but these patches look like that. And basically, this formed um, my whole PhD, and I continued on that work uh, later on. So what we introduced is what I call um, um, uh, paths uh, mapping and tracking. So it's like slum, right? But with, with patches um, where the input is, is RGBD data and IMU data. Then you find potentially contacts around the robot which are sparse. So they're much less than uh, point clouds. So if you, if you have in one uh, in one um, uh, frame rate uh, in one frame, I don't know, 300,000 points. Now we are talking about 50 patches that are potentially good for stepping. Uh, and then these were fed into the robot that uh, uh, could apply some locomotion primitives in order to, to, step, to step into rocks. Uh, here on the tracking part, um, we used um, uh, Kinect Fusion. Uh, our own version of Kinect Fusion, which called Rx Kimfu, uh, which basically I don't know if I yeah I have a I have a video later, but basically instead of having a fixed three um, um, D um, uh, bounded area that you do the tracking, this box is moving with the robot, because our assumption was that when you hike. You don't want to know what happened five kilometers behind you, but you really want to know what is the surrounding area that uh, you are hiking on. And, uh, and um, we use this tracking, tracking method uh, to do that. When I moved to IT, so this, is, this was a very simplified, sorry. Yeah, wait, give me a second. Yeah, this was a very simplified uh, stepping, not even climbing uh, 
um, method. So you know, like I was finding a patch, and then I was, I was, I was placing my foot in a predefined uh, motion. Okay. So when I went to IIT, and this uh, this uh, concluded my PhD, but when I went to IIT, I keep working on this geometric reasoning of uh, of locomotion, where I really figure out how uh, somebody can do really fast. So uh, five in five milliseconds or three milliseconds. Um, so you can really feed it in the control loop. Uh, uh, a detailed uh, point co uh, um, point contact analysis, contact analysis between between surfaces on the robot, so uh, square feet for the for the left robot, and the environment. And uh, we threw that into real time uh, inverse kinematics uh, locomotion um, uh, method in order to uh, to to deal with with this kind of environments. So rocks that you don't assume that you have a full contact between the foot and the, and the surface, but this can be any kind of contact that is stable enough to allow you to allow you stable. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of proud of this work because this is my only best paper award that I got. And, uh, and it's, it, it, was, it was a very joyful paper. Nobody believed in that, but it, it was really nice in the end. Um, so naturally, the next step was, again, this is just a stepping. So naturally, the next step was, okay, can we, can we throw this into a um, path planning method? We call them footstep planning in, in, in leg robotics, where basically uh, you want to go from one place to the other, and you need to, uh, to understand where exactly you, you, you need to step. And that was a nice collaboration on, your le on the left part uh, with uh, Oscar Bostrick in uh, Darmstadt. Uh, university um, lab that we introduce a way to include the patches, the environment representation that I introduced into um, an A star type of of, uh, of um, path planning. The interesting part is that the same type of uh, of planning method uh, can work on different robots, uh, like the Centauro robot. So the Centauro robot is a wheeled four leg. Um, robot. It's like the, I don't know if you know the mythology, like it's like a centaur. It's like half human, half animal. Okay. Uh, it's one third human, one third animal, one third car. Okay. Because it has the wheels. And um, and this is an, a nice work that we did with uh, one of my PhD student, Bigness, graduated last year uh, from IIT uh, onto integrating this kind of um, a star, or it, it's not A star, it's search based um, uh, path planning. It's not only A star, I mean, uh, into dealing with um, challenging environments where basically you need to perform uh, uh, complex motion between uh, uh, for all your legs in order to deal with the uh, with environment. This is, again, this is real time, so nothing pre, uh, pre computed. All right. So the second part, I think. Uh, of of our research, uh, so this 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 part of the research was about planning footsteps and trajectories, like uh, the motion planning of of uh, legged robots. The second part that uh, we we really uh, invested time on was uh, state estimation, right? And 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 there is a big question of what is state, what is this, what is the state of the robot? Um, I think in in the case of humanoid robots and and mainly on humanoid robots, but also on, on, on other leg robots, is uh, the center of mass of the body of the, of the robot. All right. Now, in quadrupedal animal, this might be a little bit easier because you assume that the legs are massless. All right. So basically, all the weight of the robot is on the body. In a humanoid robot, this is a more challenging uh, problem because the legs they do have mass, and this uh, ruins all the dynamics, basically, uh, the dynamic estimation. So that was an interesting problem. Uh, here I'm just showing the visual slam, the, the method I told you. Uh, maybe I can play it from the beginning to, just to show you that, basically, our, our Kinect Fusion is, is a box that is, when you reach the end, so when the robot is moving, it moves, okay? It's, it's more like an engineering paper where you have to remap in the GPU the cells from one to the other, which is, which is 
and, and this is where it lags a little bit. So it is very fast. It's like in fusion, but then, you know, it lags a little bit because it does all the remapping. Uh, but it works pretty good, to be fair. Uh, so if you don't have like drones, which are super fast, for humanoids, this works, or uh, animaloids, this works very good. Uh, in terms of state estimation, uh, I work with a group at, uh, in uh, Crete, uh, so Panos Trahanias group and, and Stelios Piperakis. Uh, Stelios did the, the most of the work, if not all. Uh, but we developed a very nice uh, state estimation system based on, on Palmer filtering. Um, uh, the, the most challenge of, of humanoids is like, maybe, maybe you can see this, this fun motion here. It's like it slips a lot. Okay, so basically you need to understand when you, when you assume contact with the environment. So imagine that if I do a quasi-static walking, I can always have a fixed base that I can compute the inverse kinematics or the inverse dynamics. But when you, when you sleep, this is all, all ring. So uh, what we try to do with Stelios is develop, um, uh, develop the zero it's called, uh, um, a state estimation system where you can figure out the, based on, on multiple, on multiple um, uh, entries like the kinematics, uh, food sensor, so forced work uh, re um, ankle sensor, uh, and 3D visual um, uh, slam uh, to be able to understand and estimate the uh, 3D base and center of mass uh, of the uh, velocities and accelerations of the, of, the, of the robot. This is a work with uh, Oliver Stassen from uh, La CNRS in Italy. Uh, he provides us data on Talos uh, robot. And um, uh, you can see that we're pretty close. I think the, the yellow is the ground truth and the estimate is the, is the, um, uh, uh, the purple. Uh, maybe it, it doesn't appear here, but we're very close in the estimation. So we use that as our state estimator in the in the humanoid robots, uh, and we are working towards adding this in the in the quadrupedal robots. Of course, it's a bit different because, as I told you, the quadrupedal is a little bit easier case, usually. I think the the, the last part that uh, it's very interesting to me, and uh, I think it plays a role, and uh, I was very interested in, is uh, what happens. So now we, we talked about stepping based on, uh, on um, geometric representation of the world. So either it was rocks or grass or mud or water, it didn't play any role. You would get a point cloud, you plan your steps and that's over, which is obviously wrong, right? So what we thought was, all right, so how about, oh, that, that was the beginning of, um, yeah. We were basically getting models from the computer vision community and applying it to robots. All right, so that's that's a, a CNN there and end to end, I would say, and the classic encoder decoder um, structure. Um, so what we what we try to do here, maybe let's play again the videos. On the upper part, we have um, now I just show you the grass one. We just get data from the four stroke sensors in order to be able to understand mechanical properties of the, of, the, of the ground. On the lower part, we use the RGBD data to, to figure out the, the type of the terrain and the, and the roughness of the terrain. So uh, basically, why this, this helps is that, first of all, before you contact the environment from visual feedback, you can get an understanding of what type of environment it is. So you can change your gait or your control um, uh, you know, in, in any sense that you would like, in in, in our in our uh, in our experiments, basically we had the robot standing completely up, and then when it was it was finding something rough, it was just lowering the center of mass as you would do if you were walking on something um, slippery or or, or, or rough, uh, and and, this, and the upper part is when. When you get an assumption of something, so you have a prior that says, oh, this is um, grass, but it's not, it's like something else, then you can really feel it. Actually, this is like, it's, it's like tactile uh, sensing. You can really feel it and see the mechanical properties, which is stiffness, 
slip, slippage and, uh, and this kind of properties. And uh, again, this is like um, implemented as a, as a big net um, on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the robot working uh, online. All right, so now let's think a little bit about local manipulation. So I do know that most of people in robotics, they like pick and place uh, tasks. I'm not in favor about <laughs> this type of research. Um, what I like though is, you know, resolving this kind of problems. So, you know, like heavy items, items that you really need all your body in order to, to grasp, to manipulate. And that's why I call this local manipulation or whole body manipulation as, as, as usually uh, they, uh, they call it. So, uh, and I do think that there are a lot of open problems there uh, on how to, uh, how to deal with this problem. Imagining that so far the research community has focused on pick and place of small items. Imagine when you go to something, to something heavier there. Uh, to do that, we, we work on multiple directions. One, one direction is, is uh, mechanical design of grippers and uh, manipulators. Um, this is the work with uh, uh, a student of mine, Luke, and, and Helge from the mechanical engineering department of, of, of UCL. Um, and basically, uh, our whole purpose there was uh, an application like Ocado, where you had to grasp uh, heavy fruits or batches of fruits uh, without really um, ruining the fruit itself or, the, or, the, or this batch. And um, well, th this was published in 21 IROS, but we keep improving that. So uh, this is an old prototype. So now it's much smaller and, and neater. But basically, the whole idea about this prototype is the enga engaging of the, of the, of the item. So basically, we have, and the uniqueness, I think, is not the three fingers, but it's the palm that goes in and out in order to, uh, to capture the, um, uh, the, um, the item uh, more stable. Okay. And uh, obviously now, uh, Luke is working on to adding sensing into that, um, with gauge, uh, yeah, adding sensing and, uh, and uh, using uh, reinforcement learning in, in in order to control grasping on this novel, novel uh, gripper. Second part, which I told you, is that what, what, I'm, what I'm interested in. So there are two parts here. I'm not going to bother too much with this because this is something like, OK, it, it might not be appreciated in the research community, but for me, it was really nice. Basically, when, when I introduced this uh, footstep planner based on, on, on patches, I call them, on a, on a model representation of the environment, what I thought is that wouldn't be nice to have the same exact model of, uh, of the environment for manipulation and locomotion. All right, so something that I can represent the environment with, and uh, it can be either for walking on it or grasping. Okay, so I have a very particular set of, of, uh, of um, grasping primitives, let's say, and this is somehow like applying the same, the same, um, uh, the same approach as the locomotion with the same models uh, on, on some items. So that, that was nice for me because I could prove that with the same model I can, I can do geometric models of the environment. I can do uh, multiple things. This is the most interesting part. So when we went to, uh, I, I was in the team for the DRC 2015 Walkman uh, in California. Uh, the challenge, the DARPA challenge, uh, and on the upper, on the upper um, picture, you see a CMU robot uh, that is grasping a debris in order to remove. So the task was: you have a bunch of debris, you grasp them, you remove them, so you can pass. Okay. Uh, all right. You see a really bad grasping there, right? Why? Okay. First of all. It's probably not stable because you grasp it from a place in the very edge of the wood. I mean, a human would never do that, probably in this way, because you will probably you will break your arm, you will break your motor, uh, you waste energy because it, it creates a lot of torque for your motors, 
And Prova is dangerous for the robot and the environment itself. Okay. Uh, the solution of DARPA, because uh, th this was the common case for all the teams, was to make the wood massless. <laughs> so basically, they are fake wood. Uh, so now you see that they can, they can grasp this. But this grasping is really bad. What we tried to do at IIT was that uh, we thought that, okay, basically, the the, the, an item should be grasped closer to the, in the center of mass to remove unnecessary torques. How do I do that? If I don't have any prior knowledge about the, the, the object. If I do it, if I know that it's a hammer and I know that it's, it's, you know, the mass is somewhere, then that's good. But in, in our case, we use the, the force torque sensor of the wrist. Having prior knowledge of grasping uh, places uh, with, the, with, the, with the visual sensor, with RGBD sensing, uh, we try to grasp closer to what we assumed was the center of mass, and by raising it and measuring the torques, we knew exactly where is the center of mass of the object, which could be in the object or outside the object, doesn't matter. If it was outside the object, then we would grasp it with a closer, with a closer um, item. And, and, and this is basically what, uh, what, uh, what you see here. I don't know why the video is not playing, but yeah. Yeah. Basically, you, you get an idea of uh, where is the, the you assume you the, the center of mass is somewhere here. The center of mass is in the is in the blue uh, in the blue spot. You you grasp, you raise a little bit. Uh, you understand where is exactly the center of mass, and then you grasp basically on the on the right uh, autonomously on the right on the right path. <coughs> By the way. Walkman was a very dangerous robot because it, it had very big motors, uh, and we we didn't allow for fa we didn't allow the robot to do fast movements. It's not because it cannot; it can, but we limited the torques of the motor because its motor cost like three thousand, and we didn't want to break. We we broke some, but no, Nikos was not very happy about this. Um, all right, a another direction that I work with, uh, with a student of mine, Han. Uh, and again, this was the time that uh, you know, deep learning came into the, into the game. Is is uh, what we call affordance uh, localization. Okay, so basically, again, the end-to-end -end system, uh, deep network uh, that gets inputs like RCD, depth, gravity, and so on, and uh, it creates masks. I know now this doesn't look very novel. <laughs> Uh, because now you have all the, you know, mass cars in them, etc., etc., or the any segmentation that uh, that was introduced uh, recently. But back then, that was that was really nice uh, and novel. Um, I think this is our most cited paper uh, overall uh, because it, it was something new that the robot could basically figure out uh, the type of the object that want to grasp, and then it was applying. Uh, it was finding the mask of, and then it was finding the affordance so that this part is the graspable part, this part is the durable part, part. and, um, and uh, we, we could do this knife movement. And of course, we, we continue with this research with Anne um, on, on uh, translating videos to robot commands uh, using, uh, back then, this was before Transformers again, I know, uh, using um, um, uh, LSTMs. Uh, so basically, understanding how a human is manipulating objects and trying to, um, through an RNN, through LSTM, basically try to figure out what kind of commands. This is purely supervised, both methods uh, are purely supervised methods into dealing with this and uh, with this part. Uh, so then at, at UCL, uh, I think this might be one quote that uh, Ms. Edge group might be more familiar with. Uh, it's, um, it's the work we do with Dennis, Nordes, and Mark. Um, which is one short uh, affordance localization, basically, we call this, of course. Um, which is three steps. Uh, so we used um, V descriptors, which are pre trained models, basically, of the, of the environment. So it, it takes an RGB image and uh, brings it down to, uh, to, um, to, um, to um, latent space that you can find the, the, the descriptors, and then uh, it is, it is, it is, um, you, okay, 
you cluster the descriptors, and then it's about matching the descriptors of the of the of the um, of the goal image towards your your uh, queue image. Let me explain one one thing here. The whole idea is that if I have an item that I want to manipulate, okay, and I know how to manipulate, so I know that this part is the affordance that I want to press, okay, uh, and then you give me a similar one but not this one, like something that looks like that, can I find this affordance in one shot, so without training, without learning, okay, and this is what we do here, so you see that the image that we are curing of is completely different than the the item there. So here you have a spoon, here you have a wood uh, cooking, uh, how do you call it? Um, spoon, let's say. Uh, and you are able to uh, figure out the affordances on your cure image on, the on, a, on a regular spoon and then translate this region, the affordance, let's say, but it is a region of interaction to a novel scene, completely novel scene. All right. And this is what this method does. Yeah, some things on, 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 on local manipulation. Not gonna, I'm just going to show you this. I'm not going to focus too much on this. Obviously, uh, at IT, we're, we're working on integrating uh, things. So, uh, you know, um, invest in the matrix, uh, on the robot. Uh, the input is the, the object that you want to manipulate, and uh, you have a stabilizer uh, when you grasp it so that if you fall, you accommodate the external forces, let's say, of the, of the robot. On the other side, we have a teleoperation system based on, on uh, open pose, um, uh, where you see that what the human is controlling is just the end effector of the robot. All the rest, the whole body control, is through a um, hierarchical um, QP solver, okay, under some constraints. And these constraints can, can be uh, some like torque constraints of the motors, uh, center of mass constraints of the robot, and so on and so forth. So you see, when we when we uh, complete the task, maybe in the in the following task, this is more obvious in the box feeling. You see that all the motors are moving, so the whole body is moving, uh, but the human is really coordinating only the end effectors of the robot. That's why you can you can map motions of the human to motions of the robot. And and now it's going to be more obvious that you know the full robot, uh, uh, the full uh, you know uh, motors, the whole body of the robot was able to uh, to be used in order to place one object. Okay, I'm not going to go into details. Uh, very quickly, in a similar notion, we work with Leeds University uh, into uh, whole body manipulation. Again, this is the operation. Um, uh, this is for uh, an EOD task. So basically, there was a fake bomb there that we cut the red wire or the black, whatever I understood. Um, and uh, you do that with a robot. Uh, and, uh, what, and, and of course, the operator is wearing all the VR system and the body I'm to shoot. So the question is how you translate motions of the human to the robot. And again, the way that we did it is very similar to the previous one. We cared only about uh, the relative um, velocities of the end effector of the human with respect to a fixed frame. That uh, for the human is between the legs, but for the robot is between uh, again between the four legs, and we were doing very similar, very similar tasks. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm gonna skip that. This is also something interesting I want to tell you about the whole body control. is in the same sense that, um, but a little bit more difficult task. So this is uh, this is our student Julius with uh, collaboration with Sam and Julia at UCL uh, about 3D printing. If you forget a little bit the 3D print part, or the clay part, and you think about it as the path planning problem, it's very interesting and very challenging for two reasons. First of all, when you create an environment, when you print something, 
you generate extra um, uh, collisions. Okay. Second thing is that you require continuous motion. Okay. So what Julius impressively managed to do was that he managed to with, uh, solve this problem as a path planning full body control problem, uh, where basically uh, he used um, uh, inverse uh, reachability maps uh, in order to uh, to be able to um, accommodate with uh, with the changing environment and uh, and the and the planning part of the of the, of the system, and it became something really impressive. To to tell you something, uh, this video I think. Uh, of course, it is it is it is slow because not because of the path planning part, because of the clay part. So what, when you need to like uh, when you need to print, you need to do it slow, basically, in order to, to stick there. Um, the second part is that uh, this is a very challenging problem in terms of slam because because you drift a lot. So I think in this system we used. Uh, some standard slam, I don't remember which visual slam we used, but in the end I think we hit markers and we used motion capture in order to figure out where the base is. Yeah? Andy? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you see the markers there. Eh? But, yeah, I know, but I think like he compared, in the end of the video, I think he compared, no, it's not this video. We compared the slam method. So the whole, the, 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 what was happening is that you need to go into rounds, okay? So you print clay, and again, it's a bit tricky that you print clay like that and not straight lines because straight lines would be a complete mess. Uh, but you need a way to, to, to follow the line after that. So even though your planning says something, you, you need to close the loop. You need, you need a loop closure, basically, uh, system. Online, though. <laughs> Okay, so so not in the end of the slums. So it's not like creating a map of a room where you go, you go back to the place, and then you close the loop, and then you remap things, remap the trajectory. This needs to be online, and it's super difficult, and it's an open question for us. Uh, in, in this scale, in this scale of, uh, of printing, in this scale of end effect or movement. Uh, but that's a very, very interesting work, and... Uh, um, Julius, I think he did really, really good. It was, it, it was very, very, very hard to solve. Uh, I don't know how I'm doing in terms of time. Almost there. A little bit about what we do now, uh, and of course, uh, there are not too many publications now in terms of that because this is ongoing work. But uh, what we try to do now is focus on our on our leg robots uh, and and solve what we call um, a cognitive. Uh, local manipulation in, in challenging and challenging environments. Um, so basically we do share these robots at UCL and you are welcome to visit them and see them in person. Um, uh, and, and one of these has also an arm on, on top of it. it. It's not here, it's the B1, it's a, it, it, it came last month. So it's not in the, in the... It came last month and I managed to break it for some reason, <laughs> myself. Uh, but now it's fixed and it's ready to, to operate. Um, but, but the whole idea there is how can we bring, how can we actually bring robots into the real world? Uh, and, and I know that you have seen robots and led robots into the real world, uh, but usually the tasks that they're trying to solve are, um, are visual tasks, so visual inspection. The difference there is that, and, and usually the visual inspection is in industrial settings, so things that you, you know how to move, they are very flat. Uh, usually you do a round already with the robot to tell how, when, and where to step. So, and then you know the, the robot keeps going into loops and inspecting. Right. It's very impressive, uh, but we try something else. So we try to figure out how we can bring robots to the disasters. Um, here, here you see an earthquake, but the, the main partner we have is about uh, volcanoes. Um, so, how can we bring a, a lead robot into a volcano? Uh, and uh, and th there are multiple problems there. Uh, it's um, 
land, land sliding basically is one thing that they want to define or drilling and getting some some data there. Uh, how can we bring black drones into agriculture? Um, and especially to fields that are very hard to to walk and navigate in. And of course the industrial the industrial part is still there. It's a little bit more simplified, but uh, but sometimes um, uh, it could be also challenging. And of course, outer space is something that something that is, is in, in general interest. I think NASA decided in sending one leg robot, I think one spot robot into, uh, into Mars next time. So they have already a, a drone. Now they plan to bring an leg robot. And I know that ESA is also bringing probably animal uh, footers um, robot to the next mission. Uh, so th this was a competition uh, recently, like a week ago. And uh, that's, that's very interesting. Now, the way that we try to solve this thing is again combining um, prior geometric or physical reasoning knowledge with, uh, with learning. Okay, and, and this is the classic loop, right? So the, the robot is, uh, is, exploring, is exploring the environment, uh, it's, it's, uh, obse it's observing the environment, you know, you do your um, RL type of thing, uh, and then, you know, you, uh, you act, and then this goes into, this goes into, the, into the loop. Uh, now, a little bit of, of, of what we work on, and maybe you will see some uh, real demos if they work, uh, obviously, is, um, so the way it works is the following. So you need to have a controller, that could be either you know, model predictive controller, the classic MPC controller, so uh, based on the dynamics of the environment and the world knowledge, you predict uh, you know, a, a, a window, uh, or it could be in the, basically in the, um, in the RL notion, where if you think about it, it's, it's, it's quite similar. You have a reward function, so you optimize. So you optimize basically some gates that that need to be represented in the reward function. Okay. So this is an outcome of a large reward function, I think, which uh, has I don't know how many terms. It's it's like a whole table of you know the difference between the frame, uh, the frequency of uh, of various legs, the, the the height of the body, the you know stability, and so on and so forth. Uh, this side is the classic MPC uh, method uh, that um, uh, comes with the robot, basically. Uh, this is an open, open uh, uh, implementation. Now, the difference, the difference is the following, that here you do a lot of assumptions about the robot and the environment. Okay, so if you try to bring this to some rough environment or slippery environment, it might fail. Uh, plus, this needs a lot of fine tuning, and um, sometimes it might be hard to go from one over to the other. On the other side, the RL is the, is the classic RL. It might be a little bit challenging to uh, design the reward function if you go into that direction of having a you know detailed reward function. Uh, but in the end, it can it can it can work pretty uh, pretty nicely and demonstrate different different gates uh, on the robot. Last thing that I'm, I'm not going to bother you more, uh, a very interesting problem that I really love uh, on, on working, it's called uh, nav navigation among uh, movable obstacles. And, and this is something that uh, maybe the community didn't focus too much on. The problem is the following. So I have to go from one place to the other. So you are in your kitchen and you want to drink some water. And there is a chair in front of you. So typically, if you let the robot now using their path planning or motion planning method, it will do two things. Either it will avoid the chair going from all the way around to go to the sink, or climb on the chair, or go under the chair. So it will try to avoid the obstacles, basically. But that's a little bit naive, and it's, uh, I think it's not how we, how we work. How we work is that we would just pick up the chair, put it back to the table, and we would just 
pass through the, uh, the passage. Okay, and, and this is the problem that we try to solve. On, on the left part, uh, we, we, we work on this problem in the, with a wheeled robot uh, using classic A star based um, methodologies. All right, so uh, it's quite slow in the computation. So even for a couple of objects, it takes uh, several seconds to compute the, uh, the, the path. Uh, it is quite, um, yeah, quite slow, but it's quite nice that, it, 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 that is working. Um, we tried it in very simplified environments for this reason. So here is basically the, the robot cannot, uh, cannot pass. So it pushes the obstacle and then creates the path and, and goes through. On the other side, we start working on this problem from the RL point of view that we used Isaac uh, simulators or physical um, uh, physics simulators um, that you can train multiple agents uh, in the same time. And we created um, a way for the robot to push around objects in order to create space and, and navigate from one place to, to the other. Uh, we don't solve the visual part as well. <laughs> Disappointment for Andy again. <laughs> so we have markers there again. Uh, but this was not the purpose. It was not to, to close the loop at this point. It was mainly to, uh, to plan paths of pushing around uh, obstacles in order to go from one place, one place to, to another. Um, and this is what we demonstrate that. Uh, with that, I think I would like to thank you. Again, this is not, obviously, this is not uh, you know, purely my sole work. I mean, I was, I was very, very lucky to work with a large team at IIT uh, on Walkman, Centaur, and Pokemon robots. Uh, we are too many. <laughs> I will be finishing in uh, one minute. Say yes. Or we can go outside also demonstrate. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. And of course the team at UCF. Uh, time pressing, thanks a lot. And any questions? I know that the talk was very generic uh, in the sense that it was not technical. I'm happy to come and speak about a particular topic next time that will be technical and we focus on one thing. Uh, but yeah, that was an overview of what we do at, uh, now at UCL in the, in the group. Thanks a lot.